All right, well, welcome everyone. Uh, thanks very much for taking the time and uh, for uh, you know uh, joining us on this uh, webinar. Um, first of all, sorry that we could not hold the um, Asia Dengue Summit uh, 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 this year. Uh, I mean, for, uh, next year for obvious reasons. Um, and uh, certainly all, we are, all our travel plans and all that all curtail, I guess, until we have a vaccine against uh, COVID-19. Um, Nonetheless, I think this uh, um, webinar is, uh, I guess, would be a good way for us to keep in touch and keep pace with the uh, latest developments on dengue. Uh, and so uh, today it's uh, especially uh, uh, timely and uh, uh, gratifying to have uh, Cameron Simmons as our, our first speaker. And Cameron, you know, for many of us do not need an introduction. He's very well known in the field of dengue. Um, and in Asia, he's done so much to understand both the clinical as well as the epidemiology of uh, dengue in, in Vietnam. And that's where he, he you know, first blazed his trail when he joined the uh, Okru. Um, and there he, he not only started uh, some of the pivotal uh, prospective dengue studies working with uh, Bridget Wills, but um, you will recall that he's so far done the only GWAS study that really identified some of the genetic susceptibility factors for, for dengue. Uh, and from there, he went back to Melbourne uh, and then headed up, uh, did uh, this uh, trial that he's going to tell us about, uh, again, this time working with Scott O'Neill and others uh, to translate what's been a very fascinating lab work and small scale field trial into this uh, uh, cluster randomized trial uh, that you know, showed very good and promising efficacy um, that could potentially change how we uh, control dengue perhaps in the near future. Uh, so I'll pass the floor over to Cam and uh, thanks Cam for giving us this talk. Peace. Yeah, Go. thanks. Thanks, Ang, and, and um, thanks to the organisers. Um, it's nice to connect even in this uh, very disrupted year. Um, and it's good to see, I can see a lot of friends from, uh, from Southeast Asia online, so um, it's nice to catch up with old friends. And I'll go to sharing my slides. Hope everyone can see that. Yes. Uh, all good. Okay. Yep. <clears throat> so um, I, I want to give a, 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 I'll put a different hat on um, than some of you know me by, but um, I'm the regional director for the World Mosquito Program and based here at, at Monash University. Um, I look after the Oceania region, but for a number of years I've been working with Adi Uterini at uh, University of Gajamata to lead a, a large cluster randomised control trial of Wolbachia. And so that's the core of what I'm going to talk about for the next 40 minutes or so, but I'm going to wrap that trial around uh, where we are with this particular approach of using Wolbachia and finish it off with a what I think is a note of optimism about um, you know what this intervention might be able to do, plus or minus other interventions that we know are are coming through either vaccine, um, particularly vaccine uh, pipelines. Um, and so fundamentally, our intervention is Wolbachia, uh, an obligate intracellular insect bacterium or arthropod bacterium, and some nematodes. Um, hugely prevalent in the world um, and particularly in insect species estimated uh, up to 60% of all insect species have got a Wolbachia strain in them. Um, Wolbachia has never been identified as a pathogen of, of humans, animals or of, or, or of vertebrates. We're exposed to Wolbachia by virtue of uh, the things we eat, by virtue of being bitten by insects that naturally have been over evolutionary time been infected with Wolbachia. No evidence that um, Wolbachia is associated with health uh, adverse events in humans or animals. The really critical signature trait that allows Wolbachia to be used as an intervention against not only dengue, but the other medically important arboviruses, Zika, chikungunya, yellow fever, is that Wolbachia infected Aedes aegypti mosquitoes have got a lower uh, transmission potential for these viruses compared to their wild type counterparts. So Wolbachia uh, reduces the ability of these mosquitoes to transmit viruses. So that's a really important trait. 
And here's a bit of data that, um, that, that describes that, that critical trait for you. And so what we're looking at here is um, a set of uh, laboratory experiments in which we took mosquitoes with and without Wolbachia uh, and we fed them on uh, patient blood with different concentrations of virus in them and also infected with different uh, serotypes of dengue, dengue 1, dengue 2, dengue 4. And the mosquitoes that we used were either lab reared under normal sort of laboratory conditions, or they were field reared where we actually took uh, a pupae from the field in a Wolbachia established uh, location, and also wild type mosquitoes from a neighboring location, and brought them back to the lab and let them emerge. And we let these mosquitoes feed on blood from dengue patients and looked 14 days later at whether these mosquitoes had virus in their saliva. And the take home message, if you just look at the, the blue filled symbols here um, for lab grown mosquitoes, um, that on average, mosquito, wild type mosquitoes have got, are more likely to have infectious virus in their saliva compared to the Wolbachia infected, WML infected mosquitoes shown in the, in the blue triangles. And that's true for Dengue 1, Dengue 2, and Dengue 4. And in fact, that difference between wild type and Wolbachia infected mosquitoes is even greater if you sample those mosquitoes out of the field. And so the take home message here is that uh, Wolbachia increases the resistance of these mosquitoes to having a disseminated dengue virus infection, such that fewer mosquitoes, a lower prevalence of mosquitoes are infectious. And we also know that Wolbachia prolongs the extrinsic incubation time in the mosquito. So if a mosquito is going to become uh, have infectious virus in their saliva, it's going to take longer uh, in a Wolbachia mosquito compared to a wild type mosquito. So that's a really critical trait. And so this, this, this is great, mosquitoes that are resistant to getting a disseminated dengue virus infection, but how do you spread Wolbachia through a mosquito population, whether that be in Kuala Lumpur or in Ho Chi Minh City or in Jakarta? Well, the other critical trait that Wolbachia confers on the Aedes aegypti mosquito is this um, trait called cytoplasmic incompatibility. And what that means is that Wolbachia is manipulating reproductive outcomes to favour its own introgression or establishment into a mosquito population. And if we look at these three different uh, mating possibilities, we've got here a Wolbachia infected male mosquito. When he mates with a wild type female, in the lab or in the field, her progeny aren't viable. So he effectively sterilizes her. And of course, this is the basis, for example, um, in Singapore today, um, Wolbachia-based um, uh, mosquito suppression approach on the basis of, of this uh, type of cross. The other crosses that are possible are Wolbachia-infected male or a Wolbachia-infected female. When they mate, all of her progeny have got Wolbachia. Uh, very high fidelity of Wolbachia to, to the offspring. The third possibility, a Wolbachia-infected female mates with a wild type male. Again, all of her progeny are viable, her eggs are viable, and all of her progeny have got infected. And so you can imagine over time, as a consequence of these mating outcomes, that Wolbachia builds up or introgresses into the mosquito population in a stepwise fashion, if you like. It's not horizontal transmission between mosquitoes, but really a population uh, introgression. And so two critical traits I've told you about, that Wolbachia blocks the virus in the mosquito and that Wolbachia has got a mechanism of driving into a mosquito population in any, any location. And you can visualise that, and this is how we operationalise the intervention. If we go to a standing uh, a, a community in Indonesia and there's a standing population of, of vector competent wild type Aedes aegypti mosquitoes, what we do is come along and deliver pulses, regular pulses on a weekly basis of Wolbachia infected mosquitoes into the community in some sort of spatial sensible or homogeneous fashion. And we only need to do that for somewhere between three to five months typically once a week, releasing the back of the mosquitoes. We don't need to wait. Or if, um, got, um, if they could mute their mics, thanks so much. Um, we don't need to wait for Wolbachia prevalence to build to 100% because that cytoplasmic incompatibility kicks in and drives Wolbachia uh, into the mosquito population uh, over time. 
Uh, and so this process once a week, and we can do that via releasing adult mosquitoes, and you can see in these images below, releases of adult mosquitoes into the community um, in Colombia, in, in Brazil, um, in Brazil again, and in North Queensland. Here we're releasing mosquitoes in the form of eggs, and so providing them to the community to hatch those mosquito eggs in their own backyard and deliver a pulse of Wolbachia infected mosquitoes into you know, essentially their neighbourhood and do that uh, over a period of time and deliver Wolbachia to a high level in that local uh, mosquito population. So that's how we operationalise the intervention. Now I want everyone to be clear about the points of difference between this approach and the other approach using uh, sometimes Wolbachia but sometimes irradiated male mosquitoes or sometimes genetically modified male mosquitoes. And so um, on this left-hand side, you can see um, the features or traits um, that, are, that are part of our approach to uh, this intervention, operationalizing it. Um, our intervention is Wolbachia. We release male and female mosquitoes into the community. Our aim is to establish Wolbachia in the mosquito population, not to, not to change the population size, but to transform the population from one that is vector competent to one that is not. On average, it's about two to five mosquitoes per person per week in a typical average community. We've been able to demonstrate we can do this at a scale of 100 square kilometres. In Rio de Janeiro, in the city of Medellin in Colombia, we've achieved that scale. And the attractive feature of this intervention, a really defining feature, is that you don't need to reapply it is that once Wolbachia is established in the Egypti population, uh, it, all of the evidence is pointing that it stays there for years and, in fact, likely decades. And because that's the biology of Wolbachia, Wolbachia is looking after itself in the mosquito population, uh, persisting at a high level because that's in Wolbachia's interest. In contrast, the, the, uh, either the um, incompatible insect approaches or um, the irradiated male mosquitoes um, are aiming to release only males, aiming to achieve population uh, reduction, so um, a, a conventional reduction of, of the both male and female East Egypti population. But you have to release a lot of male mosquitoes because typically these male mosquitoes aren't quite as fit as wild-type mosquitoes and they need to find a female to mate with. They need to go from where you release them to go and find a female and mate and be competitive with the wild type um, um, males that are in the field. So typically to achieve that, you need to release um, a lot more male mosquitoes than we need to achieve to get more back your establishment. Obviously, the, ch you know, the challenge for this approach is scaling. You need to make a lot of male mosquitoes and you need to keep doing it. Otherwise you get, unless you achieve elimination of Egypti, you'll, and you, if you stop, you'll get rebound of that population or uh, invasion from, from the outside. Um, and so just to understand those points of difference between the two methods. Our program's got a you know, really ambitious goal. We're, we want to deliver this intervention into mosquito populations to protect 75 million people in endemic Asia and Latin America by 2025. And um, that's our goal. Um, and I'll hopefully it, in the discussion, we can talk about the challenges of scaling, but I just want everyone to understand uh, where we're working at the moment. You can see on this map, this is our global footprint at the moment. We've released mosquitoes in 11 countries. Um, so working with a, a variety of stakeholders in 11 different countries to deliver more back here into local uh, mosquito populations. And so I'm now going to, I've, hopefully everyone's on board with me on the train to understand how you know, this intervention works. What I'm gonna do is now drill down into the trial and explain why the, what, why the trial's important. The, the trial's um, critical to upscaling, to scaling globally, um, and it's critical for a scientific uh, audience um, like you as well. And, you can see this image here, you know, this is London. I spent a good three and a half years in, in London. Um, and here's a gatekeeper. Here's someone guarding, I think, you know, it might be Prince Andrew keeping him in. Um, but um, globally, we have gatekeepers for drugs, vaccines, and we also have gatekeepers for novel vector control approaches or products. Um, and so, and that's as it should be. And for novel vector control approaches, whether that be in the Egypti space or the Anopheline space for malaria, the World Health Organization is that top tier 
uh, global gatekeeper. Uh, and so, you know, they, as a, as a, as an introducer of a novel technology, you need to convince the World Health Organization that it's safe and efficacious before that intervention approach is going to appear in WHO guidelines or recommendations on uh, for the, for endemic countries on how to control uh, dengue. And so, WHO is our global gatekeeper, and they set the level of the bar for what you need to demonstrate uh, before WHO will consider a recommendation and I'll explain why that recommendation is important. But they set the bar, and I'll, we'll talk about what the bar is in the next slide. Achieving, getting over that bar is really important because what, what, what follows, um, if they give a tick uh, to, uh, if, if as a developer of the Wolbachia approach, if they give a tick that, that, you know, that they're convinced that uh, this method provides substantial public health benefits, then what follows is a policy recommendation or a guideline recommendation from WHO. And that's, we know that to be very influential in the dengue world to um, national countries who often base the World Health Organization guidelines as their reference point for developing their, their, their national programs. So important in the real world, um, WHO is a gatekeeper because it influences um, what countries do. It also influences the appetite for large development banks and global funders a WHO tick of approval uh, makes an intervention, whether that be bed nets for malaria or Wolbachia for dengue control, makes it eligible for um, loans to countries or large investments to help expand a partic this particular disease control approach. So fundamentally, WHO is important. The, the hurdle, the height of this bar is high, uh, but they are the global gatekeeper. What does WHO need to give the tick that I've talked about over here. Well, the vector control <laughs> advisory, uh, the vector control advisory committee at WHO uh, wants to see randomised trials, and it really wants to see um, it wants to see two epidemiological studies with a very strong preference that they both be randomised trials. But there is also a precedent for one uh, one randomised trial plus other evidence, uh, perhaps, for example, in, um, you know, not randomised, but convincing um, alternative study designs. And so the take-home message is that WHO to, to uh, endorse a novel vector control approach uh, for dengue wants to see randomised trials. Um, and so, and not only ran not randomised trials that demonstrate, uh, for example, a reduction in the mosquito population size, but randomised trials that demonstrate uh, an epidemiological benefit to the community, so a public health benefit, um, and you need to show that by by measuring de dengue incidence. A trial that we've done with our colleagues at the University of Gajamata, with the support of the City of Jogjakarta and the districts uh, of Slaman and Bantul. Um, and the trial is called Applying Wabaki to Eliminate uh, Dengue, and the acronym is AWED, and so I'll, I'll say AWED a few times. It's a non-blinded, cluster-randomised trial to assess the efficacy of well, back here, infected mosquito deployments to reduce dengue incidence in Jogjakarta. That's the that's the formal protocol title. Title on the bottom here, I'm showing the timeline to give you an idea of, of how long we've been working and how recently we we delivered the outcome for this trial. We the work really the work. There should be another dot point here that really goes back to 2012 and 13, where um, where the project was first. Um, getting off the ground and, and thinking about and doing some small pilot deployments um, outside of the city of Jogjakarta to demonstrate feasibility um, and, and really to learn to work together. For the trial itself, we, the community engagement aspects of the trial, this is a citywide trial in Jogjakarta, began in 2016. The randomization event, and I hope people will ask uh, Addy at the end of this talk about the randomization, January 2017. First mosquito releases took place in uh, March 2017 uh, in the first uh, series of clusters. The last mosquito releases took place in November 2017. In January 2018, we switched on the clinical enrolment aspects of the trial. In March 2020, uh, because of COVID, we stopped the trial, having enrolled um, what our uh, independent data monitoring committee uh, thought was a, 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 a you know, a, a suitable sample size that was um, available for analysis. And we've, in the last three months, we've delivered that analysis 
um, with an uh, independent trial st statistician, um, independent steering committees, independent um, um, monitoring uh, for, for uh, good clinical practice and, and data integrity um, for this trial. And so to now start drilling into the, the technical aspects of the trial. So hold on, um, stay with me th through this next five, six slides. Um, so here we are in Jogjakarta City. We're in the special um, region of Jogjakarta. This is the city. This is the footprint here on the right-hand side of the trial. And I'm already giving away. You can see the clusters uh, uh, marked on this map. There's about 312,000 people living in the 26 square kilometres uh, of, our, of our trial area. And we uh, allocated that 26 uh, square kilometres to 24 clusters. Uh, where possible, there were these cluster boundaries, uh, we tried to have hard borders uh, to stop mosquito migration. That wasn't always possible. And we did a constrained randomization in thinking about uh, uh, in, to ensure a balance of key variables, baseline variables, to try and get a well-matched uh, two-arm uh, uh, trial. So matched in variables that we believed were going to be important uh, to the final outcome measurements. Our intervention, WML, Wolbachia deployments, is occurring on as an adjunct to the standard of care dengue control activities, which in this setting, from a public health sense, is largely um, you know, vehicle-based fogging um, of either pyrethroid or malathion-based um, uh, adult insecticides. Okay, and so... The primary endpoint end for the trial was the efficacy of WML deployments to reduce virologically confirmed dengue case incidents. So not mosquito counts, um, no other clinical proxies. Uh, this is the gold standard, uh, as you would see in um, commercial uh, vaccine trials, virologically confirmed dengue um, as determined by PCR or, or NS1 ELISA. That's what you had to be to be a confirmed uh, dengue case in this trial. And Fundamentally, we're asking the question, um, does WML reduce the incidence of VCD cases in Wolbachia neighbourhoods compared to uh, untreated neighbourhoods? Had a range of secondary endpoints, outcomes you can see here, obviously, serotype specificity. We were looking out for chikungunya and Zika uh, in the trial uh, window, but um, you know, we were never really confident of being able to detect these um, based on the, on the epidemiological history in Georgia. We're looking at um, also um, through the passive surveillance system, impacts of Wolbachia on hospitalised DHF case incidents. I won't talk about that today. Um, and also Wolbachia mediated effects on it is Aegypti or it is, it is Albopictus abundance in the trial period. Um, and we knew from the outset um, that a sample size of 400 v VCD cases and four times as many controls uh, was going to be uh, enough to detect a 50% reduction, so an efficacy of 50% reduction in VCD case incidents with 80% with, uh, power. And we did that because we thought anything less than 50% with married together with this novel approach may not be compelling enough uh, to, to a, a global audience. And so really we felt that this intervention needed to really have a big impact um, um, to... to um, generate a lot of enthusiasm because of its novelty in, in, the, uh, in the global landscape. And so how did we go about measuring that primary endpoint? Um, and so what we did was perform a, a, a case test negative design over the top of this randomised deployment of Wolbachia. So 12, 12 clusters received Wolbachia, uh, 12 were left untreated. And what we did was to enrol undifferentiated fever cases at at 18 primary care clinics that were scattered uh, throughout the city. And from, a, from a, a trial perspective, we determined their exposure status under the intention to treat principle by where they lived. And so if you lived in a Wolbachia-treated cluster, you were deemed uh, Wolbachia-exposed uh, for the primary analysis. We also did a second layer of analysis that accommodated people's individual mobility, but also the individual fluctuations of Wolbachia in, uh, in the 12 clusters. And, we'll, and we'll, I won't talk about the per-protocol analysis, but um, uh, largely because the intention to treat, um, it's in line with the intention to treat results, but it, uh, this is really um, the best way of reporting the outcome. And so 
Fundamentally, for the epidemiologists, the intention of trend analysis of the primary outcome is calculated by comparing the odds of residents in uh, W maltreated clusters amongst VCD cases versus test negative controls. And so fundamentally, we, we're testing the hypothesis that will back here will reduce the number of uh, VCD cases, uh, case incidents in more back here treated areas compared to untreated controls. And so just to unpack, you know, this is um, the case test negative design is not a cohort design, but it's an approach that's used every year in multiple countries to measure the effectiveness of influenza vaccines. So, uh, so the trial, the design itself is not novel. What we're doing is, is marrying this particular approach to a, a cluster randomised trial, and that is a novel, um, a novel approach. And so I want you to think about the city of Jogjakarta consisting of people a population of at-risk people for dengue, you know, that two to 50 year of age sort of age group or three to 45. Some of them live in Wolbachia treated areas where Wolbachia has been established and others live in untreated areas. Now, some of those, some of this community is going to, at some point in the trial window, is going to develop a fever and they're going to attend primary care. And at one of our 18 clinics, our research team is going to determine whether they are eligible for entry into the, into the trial on the basis of their age, on the basis of a, a, a short acute illness, undifferentiated, um, that might have been dengue, but, but may, have been, may have had other um, etiological causes as well. So really, uh, our enrolment was based on um, undifferentiated fever cases, three to 45 years of age, who lived in the uh, study area. And that population of enrolled participants becomes uh, the study cohort, if you like. And to that study cohort, we apply gold standard diagnostics. And those gold standard diagnostics, the PCR, uh, NS1 ELISA, also some IgM and IgG serology, determines who clearly doesn't have dengue when, they, when they're, uh, that their acute presentation is not dengue, but it also identifies who is clearly dengue, who are the VCD cases uh, in, that, in this uh, uh, clinical cohort that was studied. And in these population of either clearly not dengue controls or clearly dengue uh, cases on the basis of um, diagnosis, there's going to be participants who either live in untreated areas or live in Wolbachia treated areas. Uh, and the same here for this group. And so for the epidemiologists, you can see a two by two table emerging here that uh, tests the hypothesis that Wolbachia uh, exposure is associated with a, a lower likelihood of being diagnosed with a, being identified as a VCD. I just want to now just speak to the Wolbachia intervention and, and just to describe, you know, how smoothly WML Wolbachia went in to these mosquito populations. And so down the bottom here on this left-hand uh, bottom panel, you can see Wolbachia frequencies uh, in each of the 12 clusters over time. This grey shaded area is the period of Wolbachia deployment, mosquito deployments in the, in the shape of eggs into the community. The Wolbachia frequency as a percentage of the Aedes aegypti population climbs during the release period. Releases stop November 2017 and Wolbachia stays high in the mosquito population without any reapplication, without doing anything. Um, very, you know, on average, the Wolbachia cluster frequency was 93% um, in clusters through this 27 months from January 2018 to March 2020. If we go over here to the untreated 12 clusters, you can see um, the, uh, we, our monitoring began for Wolbachia um, at late quarter four in 2017. Pretty quiet, really not much Wolbachia creeping over into untreated clusters. Um, these are cluster level Wolbachia frequencies. But by January 2019, you can start, see some particular clusters uh, building up Wolbachia into the mosquito population. Um, and so, as I said, if you came back in 18 months, you'd find um, perhaps many of these untreated clusters looking a lot like our treated clusters in Wolbachia. Uh, and so, you know, the important point is that despite the trial stopping in March 2020, Wolbachia continues on uh, in the mosquito population without the need for reapplication. Okay, this is the clinical part. This is the clinical cohort that was enrolled in the 18 primary care clinics. Um, and so participants were, were, had to, to come into the study, you had to live in the study area, and therefore you either lived in one of the 12 intervention clusters or one of the 12 untreated clusters. 
And we screened for eligibility, nearly 54,000 participants coming into primary care clinics. Most were excluded because they didn't um, meet the uh, inclusion and exclusion criteria, or they, or they um, were not interested in, in participating. Those that were eligible met the inclusion exclusion criteria, which were wonderful days of foot fever, aged 3 to 45, lived in the study area, no other specific diagnosis that would lead the clinician uh, doing the enrolment to think another diagnosis, um, a, a specific diagnosis uh, was, was more likely. These are really undifferentiated fever cases and hadn't been enrolled in the previous four weeks. 3 to 45 years of age because, uh, you know, strong historical evidence that this was the at-risk age group. So 8,144 participants of whom 3,721 lived in Wabaki treated arm versus 4,423 who lived in the untreated arm. Of that population, 385 were identified as VCDs, virologically confirmed dengue, and 5,921 um, were clearly not dengue, no virological or serological evidence of, uh, of acute or past um, dengue virus exposure. So this is a very conservative group. Um, you really had to be negative across the battery of, of Wolbachia, or sorry, of dengue assays to come into this control group. Only four chikungunya cases in the entire study period. Um, as I said, we're very conservative and, and uh, before, in a predefined way, we kicked out participants who, who might have had an IgM positivity or an IgG positivity, but didn't meet any of these strict criteria. Um, to be a case or a control. Um, of those, of these participants, um, uh, 100 participants who lived in the treated arm were, were hospitalised at any in in at any point in the three weeks after their enrolment, versus 261. So 2.9% in the treatment arm versus 6.3% in the untreated arm were hospitalised. None of our study participants died in the three weeks after their enrolment, which was the the period of follow up. Really important in this sort of design that we're, that our, our test negative controls, our controls that we're sampling here, could have been cases, PCD cases, and vice versa. And so you want a sort of a well-matched population, and that's what we found in this slide. What we're showing is the proportion of participants who sat in particular uh, cohorts or sub-cohorts uh, of our study population. So firstly, we're looking at gender. Um, in blue, it shows the percentage that were female, um, and these... Um, point estimates and, and interquartile ranges are the ages, uh, the median age at enrolment for all participants, which was 12 years of age, median age. In participants coming from the untreated arm, 11.8 um, or something years of age, um, and almost identical from the Wolbachia treated arm. So very well matched populations being drawn from the Wolbachia treated and untreated arms with respect to, to age and gender. Our, our Subcohorts, if you will, our test negative controls, again, um, 12, 12 and a half years of age. Our four chikungunya cases were mostly in young adults. Our virologically confirmed dengue cases, as we'd expect, were in, um, in a median uh, age group of uh, 11 years of age um, um, and very few VCD cases over the age of 25. So that looked good from a study perspective. So what's the take home message? What did we find? What did we okay, so that's the, that's the reveal. The headline uh, outcome was a 77% reduction in VCD cases in Wolbachia treated areas compared to untreated areas. And this, um, and this plot um, unpacks the top line result. So firstly, um, we're looking at um, VCD cases here. We identified 67 amongst 2,905 uh, participants in the in the analysis data set, so 2.3% of, of participants from the treated area uh, were VCDs versus 318 out of 3,401 from the untreated arm um, of the trial. So 9.4% of participants were VCD cases from the untreated arm for a point estimate of 77% with tight confidence intervals. And so you know, even if the truth was sitting at, this, at the lower end of this confidence interval. This is still a very large, large effect. And then what about the serotypes? And so, you know, we all know that, um, you know, dengue vaccines before, um, you know, have, have a profile that, you know, is not typically, you know, pan serotype in their efficacy. Um, 
In the trial cohort, um, the most prevalent serotypes were dengue 2 and dengue 4. And as a consequence, our estimates of efficacy against those two serotypes uh, are most robust with respect to um, the point estimate and confidence for interval around them. So for dengue 2, the point estimate was 84% with a tight confidence interval. For dengue 4, 74%, um, again, with a, quite a reasonable confidence interval. Dengue 1 and 3, we had uh, fewer events and therefore wider confidence intervals, but the point estimates are landing in the same space. Um, and so that's uh, really encouraging uh, that we're seeing. And Uh, against uh, dengue one to four, there were there were some VCD cases on, identified on the basis of the NS1 ELISA positivity, uh, who we couldn't identify the infecting serotype. Um, but nonetheless, amongst that subpopulation, we're landing with a very similar point estimate. Um, um, so, um, re really good alignment um, at the subgroup level for uh, for efficacy. Another, um, you know, obviously critical feature from, if you think about from a public health lens, what's the clinical burden of dengue? The biggest, you know, from a, a healthcare system perspective, it's those hospitalised cases. It's the outpatient department. It's making decisions about who to send home and come back in a day or two or who to admit. It's stopping the, the wards from uh, over flooding. Um, and so here we're demonstrating um, 13 hospitalised VCD cases from the treatment arm, 0.4%, versus 102 out of 3,401 from the untreated arm, or 3% of, 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 participant, of participants from the untreated arm were hospitalised with VCD. So, um, so a really robust um, um, efficacy outcome here for preventing hospitalisation, 86%, um, with a pretty good... Um, 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 tight conference interval. So this, everything's pointing in the same direction of a large intervention effect size here for against virologically confirmed dengue. The other way you can cut, and, and again, so this were, were the, the, the first layer of intention to treat analysis of, of the primary outcome. Our second approach to analysing the primary endpoint was to ask the question, well, how spatially homogeneous is the effect? And our expectation is that if, if, the, if the intervention is um, working in the way that it should, it should be demonstrating uh, a, a, an effect across all 12 clusters. And so, and th indeed, that's exactly what we found. And so what this plot shows is um, the proportion of participants from each cluster, 12 clusters in the intervention arm and 12 in the untreated arm, that were VCD cases. And so this is uh, really a percentage of participants uh, with the bubble size representing how many participants from each of the are uh, being drawn from each cluster. And so you can see here, 11 out of the 12 Wolbachia treated clusters had a lower proportion of VCD cases in their um, drawn population compared to the untreated clusters. Um, and so what we're seeing to match the effect size here that we're measuring with that first layer of intention to treat, we're seeing a spatially homogeneous uh, effect size that's that's highly significant. So really encouraging that the intervention is in many ways biologically reproducible across 12 different clusters in Jochikata. So to wrap this little piece up, um, this is the first trial that's targeted, delivered an intervention focused at his gypti that's demonstrated a reduction in incidence of, of virologically confirmed dengue. Um, and the, you know, they're really outstanding. What I want, if, if you remember anything from this talk is that the intervention is self-sustaining. You don't need to go back and do it. And that it's resilient to the disruptions of, of COVID, of financial crises, of, uh, of changes in government, of changes in personnel, of community um, events that mean traditional public health don't work. So once it's in, Wolbachia stays in the population, continues to, to deliver the intervention effect. And even better, it's equitable doesn't matter whether you live in the posh and the rich, uh, high income part of town, or whether you live in the low income part of town, the, the intervention uh, continues uh, to offer benefit irrespective of your social, your personal circumstances. And what's exciting, and I'll unpack that in a couple of slides, is we think the trial may well be an underestimate of the true effect size because people are mobile in this trial uh, landscape. People are moving about, uh, they're going from 
Wolbachia treated areas to untreated areas and vice versa. And we also know Wolbachia is spread in the trial. And so we're really interested to see what um, city-wide establishment of Wolbachia does to, to, to dengue. And in fact, that's, and I hope people will ask Addy about that now, WML is now being deployed right across John Jakarta City, uh, the first city in first city in Asia to have a citywide deployment. And I'll just touch very briefly on, on the economics of this approach. Uh, firstly, just to position this trial outcome. So what we're reporting here um, is a um, it's a 77 sorry um, percent reduction in dengue case incidents. Uh, it's very it compares very favourably with. The 18 month readout from the Takeda dengue vaccine, um, um, certainly better than the Sanofi uh, readout 12 months after the last dose. And for perspective, this is um, from a meta analysis of insecticide treated nets to stop falciparum malaria um, incidents. And so um, this is uh, very clearly in our, in our dengue and vector borne disease landscape a large effect. In Indonesia, what can the, what can the intervention do at scale? And so this is work not by us, but by Ollie Brady and Don Shepard, um, Ollie from London and, and Don from, from the Boston area. Um, but really the take-home message from their work is that if you deployed Wabakia, given um, this level of efficacy of reducing dengue, that it may cost 300 to 500 million to deploy Wabakia citywide in the biggest um, uh, urban areas in, in, um, in Indonesia. But given the case burden in Indonesia that you would avert over a 10 year period, 1 million cases, stop 500 uh, deaths per year. Uh, importantly, pay back the investment over 10 years because of direct and indirect savings um, to communities, to, to government um, um, because of this uh, health benefit. And not a, that's just the dengue piece, you're also buying protection against, we have every expectation buying protection against Zika, chikungunya and, you know, the disaster that could be you know, urban yellow fever in Asia, that would be horrible. And very briefly, when you think about this is really immunising the landscape to stop dengue transmission. And it doesn't make sense to deploy Wolbachia globally, willy nilly, agnostic to where the disease burden sits. What it makes sense to do is to think about targeting those urban areas where most of the disease burden sits. And that's largely correlated with population and population density in the urban and peri-urban areas of South Asia, Southeast Asia, Central and uh, parts of Latin America. And so you can think about, you know, this idea of precision public health to deploy Wolbachia where it delivers the most bang for your buck. And really close to the end now, I want to I want to just be provocative and bring back to the title of my talk, and that's you know, could we achieve dengue elimination, effective dengue elimination with this, with this intervention, plus or minus other tools? And clearly this approach is complementary to other tools that are designed to suppress the mosquito population uh, or to dengue vaccines. Uh, you know, one day we might have one. And of course, there's a whole, how would you verify elimination at a city level? And I hope everyone's going to be watching Georgia Carter over the coming years. There's a whole framework to borrow from in the malaria world. To, to understand graduating from an endemic area to a dengue-free area to an effective dengue elimination as a public health problem. And there's a, a well-worn pathway uh, to achieving elimination. And so I think we don't need to recreate the wheel to think about dengue elimination um, as well. Uh, there's really good solid frameworks to think about. Really close to the end now, and I wanna position the trial against our other evidence uh, globally and um, what we're seeing here is a 77% reduction in, um, in VCD incidents in the trial. In a, in a separate study um, on the edge of Jakarta City, we've previously reported um, a, a reduction in notified dengue cases of 79% using a, a, a simpler, lower quality quasi-experimental design. In Brazil, uh, similar orders of magnitude in, three, in two municipalities, Niteroi and in Rio de Janeiro in central Vietnam, and importantly in, in North Queensland. And um, this sort of is really the motivating example of why, um, you know, elimination is so, not such, uh, you know, a far, uh, um, you know, a crazy idea in the context of dengue. And what we're reporting from North Queensland where we've been working for nearly a decade now is effective elimination of dengue as a public health problem. And, and to, 
orientate you to North Queensland where this work in the field began in 2011. Um, in really two communities in Cairns and, and in Townsville, the two big urban, peri-urban areas in North Queensland, where there's over 300,000 people with some neighbouring communities scattered in between. We've put WML Wolbachia into the mosquito population in these communities between 2011 and 2017. So really 98% of the previously at-risk locations in North Queensland have now got Wolbachia. And that will back here, WML, is self-sustained in the mosquitoes uh, since those deployments a decade ago. So if you go back um, to any of these re release areas, you go and sample those mosquitoes, um, 95 to 100% of them have got um, WML will back here. And what has that done in terms of public health? Well, North Queensland has never been endemic for dengue. What it's had is periodic introductions brought by travellers. And so what I'm showing here is... North Queensland as a whole. And on this top panel, I'm showing the number of imported dengue cases that are di get diagnosed in the North Queensland area every year. And we're putting here a, a really a clock, if you like, a setting a, a baseline of, of time zero. All of these imported cases uh, came in to locations and were living in areas that were not covered by Wolbachia. So this is the pre-Wolbachia um, treatment, if you like, for, for the area they were living in. These are imported cases who lived in Wolbachia treated areas um, and, and at the time of their diagnosis had been living in a Wolbachia treated area for a various um, period of time, from now up to, um, you know, up to seven, eight years. So these are, these are the sparks that light the fire. These imported dengue cases, often travellers coming back from Thailand or or, or, or Indonesia, bringing were viremic and, and introducing virus into the local mosquito population, creating small outbreaks. This bottom panel shows the locally acquired dengue cases. And so the take home message here is that uh, prior to, you know, stepwise deployment across the whole region of Wolbachia, is that these sparks, these imported dengue cases would light outbreaks of local dengue transmission that varied in size, um, sometimes, you know, 100, 100 cases a month in, in, in big years. Um, but year on year for the last decade, there's been uh, local outbreaks of dengue in regional North Queensland. Since Wolbachia was deployed at scale across this region, those outbreaks have stopped. And so, and this box and whisker really just sort of shows the median duration of time that these, this area has been undercover with uh, some areas that have been undercover for um, now now a decade. And so really encouraging that in a, a largely seronegative population in North Queensland, periodic introductions of viremic uh, travellers is not uh, leading to outbreaks amongst a highly susceptible um, uh, local population. So, and, um, you know, really the testimony of local public health officials is that, uh, you know, their view is that these deployments of Wolbachia have eliminated dengue as a public health problem where, where previously it had been an annual problem uh, year after year. And so I've un unleashed uh, really a volume of technical information that I hope some of, you know, some of it has sunk in. We're demonstrating public health benefit here using gold standard methods from Indonesia but with really complementary data emerging across uh, from Vietnam through to Latin America. I really want to focus in and thank on um, the, the incredibly generous Tahir Foundation in Indonesia that supported, uh, has supported the work in Jogjakarta um, for, the, for the, really the duration of the journey um, that we've been on leading to the trial and now citywide deployment. Um, and shortly even province-wide deployment of Wolbachia. And so, but together with a host of other uh, very generous donors, we're very grateful to the Tahir Foundation in Indonesia for their uh, support over a long period. And, and um, you know, I get to give the talk, um, and that's great, but, you know, there's um, massive um, expertise, um, enormous generosity from our, our friends and colleagues at the University of Gajamata, from Addy, from Chitra, Donny, um, Wasito, Egi, Ridwan, Edwa, um, Enda, Satria, Yeti, Ingrid, Inda, Tori, Bekti, all operationalised this work on the ground and did a, a stunning job. Um, from our side, um, lots of fantastic um, 
work done by Katie Anders and, and uh, Stephanie Tanimus and earlier in the, in the work, uh, Zoe Kutcher, to get, um, you know, this complex trial uh, to work uh, well. And our independent statisticians who really brought the, the technical aspects of this trial to, to life, um, uh, Nick Jewell, um, Professor at London School in Berkeley, and Suzanne Defoe, a brilliant um, PhD, now postdoc. And so I will leave it, um, leave it there and um, thank you for your time. I, I apologise for going too long um, and over to Eng. Thanks. Thanks very much, Cam. It's a very encourage, encouraging uh, uh, outcome uh, and uh, exciting uh, developments ahead.